Welcome. This is an introduction to medicinal plant chemistry with Brian Leto. Uh, I'm going to use today cannabis as a model plant. Uh, I'm not promoting cannabis per se uh, through this video, nor is this a video about cannabis, uh, but cannabis is a great way to uh, understand what some of the medicinal um, plant chemistry is just because of the fact that cannabis is so common in today's culture and so many people know uh, quite a lot about it. Uh, but they might not realize how to apply that to other plants. A plant emerges from light, breath, and lineage. So in, if we're to understand the basic elements of a plant, we have the light, that's our, the photosynthesis, the breath, that's the carbon dioxide that we and fungi breathe out in animals, uh, and lineage, that's the genetics out of which uh, plants emerge. Uh, it's important to remember that that lineage has both to do with form and environment. So cannabis as a model plant for learning plant compounds is great. There's a lot of people that are very familiar with cannabis. Um, many people have firsthand experience with it. And when we talk about something like the entourage effect with different compounds affecting the body differently, people know what that's about. Uh, there are also over 545 compounds that have been recorded from cannabis as of 2019, and I'm sure they're recording more all the time, and it's just a matter of, uh, of publishing that information. Uh, the compounds present in it are good representatives of the four main classes of plant compounds that we're going to study today and we're gonna learn about today. It's a really good idea to have this under your belt. This, this whole... Um, this whole area of study is very, very complicated and, and really vast. There are thousands and thousands of different plant compounds. So the more that we can kind of simplify the information for people that aren't necessarily plant scientists uh, or even organic chemists, uh, but maybe they're herbalists or uh, people who work with plants in, uh, in their daily life, uh, whether they're growing plant medicines, those kinds of things, uh, it's very helpful. Um, the cannabis plant uh, um, uh, is a good demonstration of the entourage effect. Uh, in, in herbalism, we call it synergistics. Uh, and that's really how uh, um, plant synergy, plant compounds work together in the human body to create a total system. We have to remember that plants don't usually have one or two compounds in them. They really have uh, oftentimes hundreds of compounds in them all working together. And it's one of the reasons why we don't uh, experience as many side effects uh, as, um, as pharmaceutical medicines that have one molecule uh, that they work with specifically. And then a doctor has to prescribe many, many different uh, other molecules, other different medicines in order to deal with the side effects. Plants generally do that on their own. Um, the other reason is the endocannabinoid system is a really important system in the human body. Uh, and we're going to look at that a little bit uh, today as well. Now, first, I want to start about start looking at the archetypal plant. Um, the word archetype is used to describe a, a very typical example of a thing, as well as a recurrent theme or a motif in literature, art, mythology, or astrology. Uh, so folks that are working a lot with astrology and with plants, uh, this is really interesting because a lot of those archetypes that we see as planetary archetypes, uh, we can also see active in, in plants. Uh, and these archetypes uh, are, you know, they're really part of our human cultural history. And I don't think it's wise to ignore something that is thousands of years old. Um, archetypes generally exist only as abstractions like mathematics. Uh, where does math exist? Uh, it doesn't exist anywhere, but it exists everywhere. Uh, however, just like mathematics, they're valuable tools to create comparisons and measurements. Now, when we're talking about the archetypal plant, uh, if we were to analyze all available data about all available plants, and from that create an image of one plant out of the commonality, all the common features of all the plants, that would be the archetypal plant. So the most basic common parts of plants include flower, fruit, seed, stem, leaf, and root. Uh, and if you look at the picture on the left of this slide, we have kind of this image of 
an archetypal plant that has all of these components in it. And so we can kind of get this, this idea for, you know, what is the, uh, what is the general idea of, uh, of a plant through this idea of the archetypal plant? Plants, insects, animals, and fungi all share common ancestry. We emerged out of unity. This emergence is called differentiation. How do we compare ourselves with the plant? So this is really important. And when we're talking about plant communication and working at a, at a deeper intuitive level with plants, uh, and as someone that's deeply interested in plant chemistry and uh, this uh, intuitive sense, uh, I feel it's very important because there are ways of knowing that Western science doesn't really acknowledge very well uh, that are more involved in, uh, uh, um, in indigenous cultures uh, and, and different types of cultures that have worked very, very successfully and in a very sophisticated way with plant medicine throughout the world and throughout history. Um, and when we talk about some of the ways that we make connections with these plants, um, you know, um, we sometimes talk about anthropomorphism uh, and, and the idea that they have a kind of human quality to them. And that's not a very popular idea. However, when we really start looking closely, uh, all of the plants and fungi actually share uh, really common uh, threads with human beings and animals. Uh, and so we really are very connected in this way. And, and while it's you know, not necessarily appropriate to talk about how a tree is feeling, um, it's also not completely uh, inappropriate to start relating to trees as uh, living entities with similar, um, with similar biology in certain regards uh, to human beings, especially when we're talking about plant medicines. So just some examples of this, just in a really, um, in a really broad kind of way, uh, if we look at the human being and we talk about our reproductive organs and everybody talks about how much orchid, orchids look like uh, sex organs. So in this part of the plant, we have reproduction and sex organs we have flower, pollen, seed, ovary, and fruit. And not only do we have this kind of the reproductive forms that are similar, uh, but we often see things like uh, phytohormones uh, and, and compounds uh, in this area of the plant uh, that are similar to the hormones that are in human beings. For example, in pine pollen, uh, pine pollen is a very good um, uh, phytohormone, especially for men, if they don't have allergies to it, uh, that are over 40 and their testosterone is waning, uh, pine pollen is an excellent, excellent testosterone booster. Um, the middle section, so we have the reproductive organs, the middle section, uh, the human respiration and plant respiration. So we have this kind of inversion going on where uh, humans have oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, meaning we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, fungi are the same way, and we're actually more closely related to fungi than we are to plants, although we all shared a common ancestor long, 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 long time ago. Uh, so the plants breathe in the carbon dioxide and they breathe oxygen out. So every leaf is really a lung. And if you look at the picture of the lungs, you can kind of see this image of it being kind of turned inside out where um, the airways uh, would maybe be uh, what we have as the trunk and the branches of the tree and the lungs themselves are kind of the leaf. Uh, and you see these kind of two almost leaf-like forms, uh, but instead of growing off of the tips, uh, they actually encompass the whole thing. So we've got this kind of interesting inversion of form here. Now, a leaf um, can't actually exhaust its CO2 very well. And uh, so every leaf is kind of its own lung and it really builds the structure of the plant out of the carbon dioxide that it's breathing in. And part of how it does this is through photosynthesis 
and an enzyme called Rubisco that's in almost every part of every plant. And this enzyme actually takes uh, the carbon dioxide along with the energy produced by photosynthesis and it turns it into sugars and from there it turns it into cellulose uh, which are uh, polysaccharides which means many sugars and i'll talk about that in a little bit but it's largely this cellulose and the miracle of the cellulose that we make paper out of that um, that the plants are able to really create their form. And so in this middle section, we have this real commonality in our respiration, but it's kind of an inversion. And we see this theme of plants and human beings being a kind of inversion of one another uh, in many, many cases. So then if we get down to the roots, um, we see that uh, the root is the area that takes up the mineral nutrients uh, from the soil as well as the water. And our head is probably the most mineralized part of the human being, meaning that it's the place where we see the most kind of crystalline structures in the terms of our teeth. Uh, and this hard material of our teeth is very mineralized. Uh, and also our eyes, our very, very special eyes that are so clear that human beings can really perceive the world uh, in such a beautiful way uh, and, and with such clarity. And that really is a, a very special evolutionary adaption. So um, in the last probably 10 years, research scientists have found that uh, the, the tips of roots um, are are often uh, neural cells. Uh, and, and Darwin uh, actually um, uh, surmised the same thing as well. So when we look at the whole rhizosphere, that's the root system, uh, we kind of see that yes, plants don't have a brain per se, but that form of these neural cells uh, and, and uh, um, the, the um, the pathways of the veins and all that kind of thing do form a kind of uh, brain structure. And, and so we see these themes that are really, uh, really evident. <clears throat> now I'm going to flip back a couple slides and just go back. Oh, I guess I can. Um, so when we're looking at uh, the study of forms, it's called morphology. And um, there's an idea that the substance and the form are two different things and they shouldn't get confused. Uh, so we have form and chemistry as kind of separate. But when we really start looking at these things, we see a lot of commonality with the forms that we can look at and the types of chemistry that are being created. And we can make a lot of comparisons uh, in this, even between uh, species. So then we get to this idea of comparative physiology. And that's the comparative study of physiology and biochemistry between different species. So looking at uh, what we're gonna look at today is a bit of um, uh, some work that I've been doing comparing uh, organs and plant chemistry, uh, uh, organs that are in the plant and their plant chemistry to organs that are in the human being uh, and their chemistry and what kind of receive, uh, receptors they have. Another thing that we're talking about a lot uh, and in the course that I'm teaching, we deal with a lot, um, the course that I'm teaching on plant chemistry and medicinal plant extraction is polarity. And this doesn't seem like it should be a big deal, but it's actually huge and really, really important. So polarity essentially is whether something is soluble in water, alcohol, or oil. So the polar molecules, what we call a polar molecule, you can think of like a battery. It has a plus and a negative, a positive and a negative. Um, those are all generally soluble in water. Uh, and then we have molecules that don't have a positive and negative side. Um, and we'll go into what that means in the, in the course. Uh, but those are the ones that don't have a positive and negative side. Those are generally soluble in alcohol or oil. And this idea is really key to understanding how to best plan a plant medicine extraction. 
Now, a plant medicine, to do a full spectrum medicine of a plant, uh, we can't always do the same uh, extraction technique. Uh, we can't uh, try to extract resins from cannabis by making a tea. It doesn't really work because the resins are nonpolar. And if you try to make a tea out of it, uh, you're not going to get the compounds that you're, you're looking for. Uh, and also, if you want to make a full spectrum uh, extract from something like cannabis, there are also water soluble alkaloids in the, um, in the leaf that if you're just extracting with high proof alcohol, you're not going to get a lot of those other compounds as well. So really knowing what plant you're working with, what the main targets are for your extraction uh, can really tell you what the best way to extract it is. So whole plant full spectrum extraction is generally best to avoid side effects. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of pharmaceutical, most pharmaceutical, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, synthetically made pharmaceuticals are a single molecule. And you'll often see that doctors have to prescribe uh, a kind of cocktail of drugs uh, to go along with that single molecule in order to deal with the side effects. If it, um, if it gives you uh, inflammation, then they've got to give maybe in addition to whatever they've prescribed, uh, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or something like this, or if it creates nausea, they've got to give an anti-nauseant, that kind of thing. Now, a healthy living plant is in a state of homeostasis. That means it's in a state of balance. Now, every plant has a slight kind of one-sidedness to it uh, that it, it, in its chemistry, uh, kind of dominates, but generally they're, they within themselves are in a state of balance. Now plants can have hundreds, if not thousands of compounds, and they're all working together synergistically in the body. And so that's why it's really important that um, uh, we, generally speaking, uh, use whole plant full spectrum extraction. There are Quite a few exceptions to this, mind you, especially when there are toxic uh, or potentially toxic elements in the plant, uh, but there are still valuable medicines in the plant as well. And we need to know as uh, plant medicine makers how to either remove those toxins or diminish their effects or not use certain types of extraction methods um, uh, that uh, that uh, don't pull out the full spectrum. Uh, for example, um, many people were having liver toxicity uh, uh, from uh, kava extracts. And these were kava extracts were being done with acetone. And the, um, the compound that balances out the kava lactones, that's the active compound and makes it um, not a liver toxin, was actually water soluble. And so they weren't getting that compound out. And so in the case of kava, the best extraction method is simply soaking it in cool water uh, and letting it sit for a few days. But everything you can't do that way. Um, and so it's very important that we have an understanding if we're gonna be making medicines uh, for people that uh, we understand their chemistry. Now, another term that we're gonna focus on or we're gonna use a lot is biosynthesis. Uh, and this is a really kind of fun word to say, uh, but it means the production of complex molecules within living organisms or cells. So often a biosynthetic pathway consists of some sort of precursor. That's the molecule that starts the process. And then the DNA codes, uh, puts out codes for uh, different types of enzymes. And those enzymes are what are doing the work of the, the chemical reactions uh, within, within the cell or within the organism. So again, biosynthesis, the production of complex molecules within living organisms or cells. And when you have what's called these biosynthetic pathways, uh, you have kind of the beginning of the pathway, the stages in between are called intermediates, uh, and then you have kind of what's maybe considered the final product. But generally what you'll see in a plant is that 
there are um, all of the intermediate uh, stages are also existing within that plant at the same time in some uh, in some proportion. Um, another important concept, different compounds are formed in different parts of the cell and plant anatomy. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So again, we have uh, the cell walls that are generally um, uh, generally not water soluble. Uh, they are what are called um, they are lipophilic, meaning they're they're kind of fat loving. Um, and so we're going to have oftentimes things that are either oily or resinous in that part. But the the liquid inside of the cell is called cytosol. And oftentimes in the cytosol, we're going to have water soluble compounds like the alkaloids that we're going to talk about later. Another important term, secondary metabolites. So primary metabolites are metabolites that maybe you'd use to bake cookies. You can think of them as things like sugars, fats, uh, proteins, starches. Uh, but secondary metabolites are organic chemicals produced by bacteria, fungi, or plants, which are not directly involved in the natural growth, development, or reproduction of the organism. Now, these are generally the plants, uh, the compounds used for plant-based medicines. And those are secondary metabolites. So when I'm talking about secondary metabolites, that's really what I'm specifically talking about is the medical, the medicinal compounds within a plant. So there are four main classes of plant secondary metabolites. Uh, phenolics, terpenoids, alkaloids, and polysaccharides. So I want you to just take a minute and look at these words. Now, they might be familiar, they might not be familiar. A couple of them, you've probably heard of terpenes before. Uh, you might have heard of alkaloids before, um, but uh, they're probably new words. Uh, so just take a look at them for a moment, kind of get a feel for them, say them to yourself a, a few times, phenolics, terpenoids, alkaloids, polysaccharides. We want to get really familiar with these so we have something to hang our hat on when we're talking about the different types of extraction methods and the different types of, types of uh, plant compounds that we're working with. Um, and then uh, biosynthetic pathways. So we talk, I talked a little bit about biosynthesis and biosynthetic pathways are the result of interactions between chemical precursors and enzymes coded by the DNA. I mentioned that earlier. Glucose is the precursor for polysaccharides. Uh, oftentimes amino acids are the precursors for alkaloids. A compound called acetyl coenzyme A is involved in fatty acid synthesis and is often the precursor for terpenoids, steroids, and phenolic compounds. And so in our course, what we're going to look at a bit is getting more familiar with uh, these diagrams, these molecular diagrams, and what they actually mean. A lot of people, when they first look at that, go, OK, I'm going to shut the book. I have no way of knowing what that is. Um, but what you're looking at on the left side of this, uh, this slide is a chart that shows you uh, um, in a kind of simplified way, to be honest, how the steps go from one molecule to another molecule to another molecule to another molecule. And so we can start to see how plant compounds are related to one another uh, by looking at their biosynthetic pathways. For example, at the bottom, uh, you see the pathways that have polyphenols and the, the pathways uh, for terpenoids, steroids, and keratinoids uh, called the isoprenoids. Uh, we're just going to call those terpenes for now. And then um, we're going to call the polyphenols uh, uh, phenolic compounds. And you see how they kind of arise from, uh, from a similar part of the biosynthetic pathway. And in fact, in nature, they often arrive together, kind of like in cannabis, where you have uh, THC uh, and a cannabidiol uh, occurring uh, in conjunction with different types of terpenes. And thus, they create this entourage effect and create different effects together. 
Here is a slide uh, from, um, uh, from uh, let's see, uh, MCAN New Zealand, and it's about cannabis awareness. Uh, you can find their information there at the bottom corner of the slide. And so this is just a sense of how pervasive the endocannabinoid system is. Mo a lot of these receptors are occurring in organs, but a lot of them are uh, also occurring in fatty tissues uh, throughout the body. And that makes sense, doesn't it? That cannabis as a resin uh, is happening uh, in uh, fatty tissues uh, because they're both nonpolar and they are able to, um, to flood into those tissues more so than in watery parts of the, of the body. Uh, when we talk about the endocannabinoids, um, it, I don't think it's stated kind of well enough that one of our primary, uh, in terms of development, one of our primary sources of endocannabinoids is in mother's milk. And so there are all these uh, endocannabinoid uh, compounds that come out in mother's milk and uh, they can act as an appetite stimulant or, um, or an appetite depressant. Um, and they can also, uh, I'm sure, quite sure, uh, soothe the baby. And so when a baby is crying for milk, uh, they're probably getting a lot of those endocannabinoids uh, in, their, uh, in their body. Um, a lot of the endocannabinoids uh, are based in uh, a serine uh, amino acid, uh, which is rather interesting rather than um, a, a, a phenol compound, uh, but they have a lot of similarities, uh, but they affect the, uh, the endocannabinoid system in the same way. Uh, and we can kind of wonder why there's this plant uh, that so perfectly matches uh, a whole system that's in our body. So here, when we look at um, these organs, um, we see this, what we call a recapitulation. So the, the same form of the organs happens over and over again. Uh, and we're gonna talk about this more uh, in more depth in the, the course that I teach. Uh, but here's an example of the pituitary gland. And so what we can see in this picture is, um, uh, first of all, it looks a little bit like a, a scrotum. <laughs> and there are these tubules out of which uh, oxytocin comes out of these hormones or out of these tubules uh, and other neurotransmitters and things. Um, and so we have this hair-like form uh, being fed by these blood vessels here. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see all the different types of breast tissue, uh, the uterus, the kidneys, um, the bones and soft tissues, uh, you know, largely the inside of the, the bones, um, uh, the testes, the corpus luteum, uh, the adrenal glands, the thyroid, and they actually form a kind of spectrum in, uh, in the way their tissues are structured that's actually really important. And it's not coincidental that, um, that the pituitary gland and the hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland are actually active in all those different tissues. It's actually a very important. So when we're looking at cannabis and we look at it under the microscope, uh, we see, see trichomes uh, oftentimes, especially when, um, the, when the bud is, is nice and ripe. And these trichomes are glandular hairs. Uh, and at the tip of the hair, you'll see a kind of blob of resin, very clear, beautiful resin. And as the plant gets older, it starts to become more amber colored. Um, but these glands uh, are uh, resin producing glands. And most of the time when you look at a plant under the microscope, and if you see these kind of glandular hairs, cannabis isn't the only one that produces them, uh, they're going to be producing phenolic compounds. And oftentimes the essential oils uh, and these phenolic compounds are resins. Uh, the essential oils, the terpenes are happening in conjunction with them. Uh, if we look at the middle slide, we see uh, a picture of the apocrine gland and, the, uh, and a, hair, a hair follicle, essentially. 
At the bottom, those little yellow spheres are the lipids, uh, are, are kind of uh, fatty tissues. And this secretory uh, tubule um, and goes along that excretory duct. Think of how similar that is in form to the pituitary gland because it's also excreting uh, um, information, uh, hormones, and that kind of thing. And these apocrine glands uh, occur mostly around areas that we get body odor from. And so that's a lot of pheromones and a lot of uh, real complicated chemistry that the, that the, the human body has to put uh, a lot of effort into creating that chemistry. There's a lot of enzymes that go into those complex uh, chemicals. Uh, and then on the, all the way on the right, we see a diagram of the, um, of the trichome, and we can really compare and contrast these quite a bit. We can see a lot of similarities uh, in the way these, these trichomes form and these kind of resins come out. Now, it's important to remember that um, most of the compounds that are being created out of um, the uh, apocrine glands are either related to phenolics or related to terpenes uh, in their structure. Uh, things like uh, steroids, pheromones, those kinds of things, all related to these, uh, these uh, um, classes of plant chemicals. And they're also very alcohol soluble because generally they're nonpolar. So they're uh, soluble in either fats or in alcohol and other solvents, but we don't really get into using those too much when we're making plant medicines. Uh, at least I, I don't really, uh, uh, I don't think it's appropriate and, and they're not as safe to use. So THC and CBD, uh, that's, um, uh, those are the, the resins that are in cannabis, uh, are both phenolic resins. They both contain a phenol group. The structure of the phenol molecule is very stable because it has something called resonance. If you look at that molecule, uh, that diagram on the left side that says OH on the top and kind of looks like a, a stop sign or the cell of a, of a beehive, uh, we see those lines that there are three lines on the inside. Those are called um, uh, pi bonds. They're double bonds. And where you see one line, it's called a sigma bond or a single bond. And um, it has resonance because those double bonds can flip back and forth uh, within that structure. And because it has resonance, it's, it actually means it's very stable. And that lends some of its kind of resinous qualities to the, the molecule is just the fact that it's very, very stable. Um, and so if you look at the picture of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, um, you can see in the center there that there is that uh, hexagonal shape with the OH group on it. And if you look at cannabidiol on the next uh, to the right, uh, you can see that same shape right in the middle. And so those, when we see that shape in the middle, uh, generally speaking, those are phenolic compounds. Uh, we spoke earlier about the biosynthetic pathway and here we have a, a diagram which we would get more into in the course of the biosynthetic pathway for uh, THCA, CBDA, and CBCA. And uh, we start with compounds called geranyl diphosphate, uh, and which is derived as, as a terpene. Uh, and then we have a libitolic acid, uh, which uh, you can see the phenolic group in, do you see that hexagonal form with that OH group? Um, and a libitolic acid, as you might guess, uh, is uh, a compound that's in olive oil. Uh, it first gets synthesized together, joined together into what's called CBG, uh, uh, cannabigerolic acid, uh, and then through various enzymes turns into THCA, uh, with THCA synthase, CBDA, with CBDA synthase, synthase, that's an enzyme that puts these molecules together, um, and then CBCA synthase uh, is for CBCA. And then, of course, these have to be decarboxylated in order to turn into THC, CBD, and CBC. And, um, and that 
Decarboxylation means it takes uh, a CO2 group off, uh, which you can see attached as that COOH on the molecule. Now, interestingly, when we compare uh, this stuff amongst the, uh, the plant and animal kingdom, we have the plant that's producing the, uh, the resins from these hair glands, the trichomes. We have human beings that are producing uh, you know, pheromones uh, and these different compounds from their uh, apocrine glands, their hair glands. Uh, but uh, many people might not realize that insects form their exoskeleton from hair glands that produce chitin uh, and phenolic acids. Uh, those are types of acids that have that that are, are part of that phenolic class of compounds. And those phenolic acids are used to harden the shell. And so if you just look at it and say, oh, that looks like amber colored resin, you're absolutely right. It's making its shell out of resin uh, and a polysaccharide which is many sugars, um, that's called chitin. Uh, and we're going to look at a, a comparison of chitin and cellulose later. Um, the cell wall of fungi also consists of chitin. Uh, because of the anti-inflammatory properties of phenolics, in traditional Chinese medicine, dissolved cicada bodies, which is what this is, that's everybody's probably seen these cicadas uh, shed their skins, um, the dissolved cicada bodies are used for itchiness and to soothe tissues in traditional Chinese medicine. And it's likely that the phenolic compounds, uh, the resins that they contain, have anti-inflammatory properties. So arising with the phenolic compounds, we have the terpenes, um, uh, also known as terpenoids. Um, so these uh, these um, compounds listed here are all monoterpenes, uh, meaning that they're a smaller type of terpene. Uh, as the terpene molecules get bigger, they start to get heavier and they are less, uh, 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 they're less fragrant and less volatile. So essential oils are generally a type of terpene called a monoterpene. These volatile oils easily go into the air and they're responsible for many fragrances and used in aromatherapy. There are also other types of terpenoids that are not as volatile because they have larger molecular structures. The terpenes work with the resins and cannabis to create what's called the entourage effect. And so in this very nice slide from Leafly, uh, we have myrcene, pinene, caryophyllene, limonene, terpinoline, and they go from left to right in terms of calming to energizing. And so they have that kind of polarity to them. Um, now, these aren't the only, the, um, the monoterpenes from cannabis are not the only monoterpenes that will work in conjunction and create an entourage effect with uh, CBD and THC. So down below here, um, it says, uh, for example, myrcene, also found in hops, mango, and lemongrass. If you eat mango and you or uh, do lemongrass tea uh, while you're using cannabis, uh, it will actually work in the entourage effect or work with the entourage effect to make it much more calming. Uh, and so we can look at these different compounds and see what we can use in conjunction uh, with the cannabis for certain effects. So in conclusion on phenolic compounds and terpenes, they're generally nonpolar, meaning they can be dissolved in oils and nonpolar solvents like ethanol. Most can be extracted through distillation, though larger molecules often require high heat. So if I'm making a hydrosol and I want to, um, I want to distill off uh, the monoterpenes that are say in rosemary, um, I can put everything in a still and uh, steam, put steam through it, and it will take those compounds and carry it off with the steam, and then it will recondense uh, into a liquid called a hydrosol that is um, what's called a microemulsion. So it's a really fine particles of those essential oils dispersed through the, the water. And those are really, really effective um, uh, uh, medicinal compounds 
uh, because the water um, and the oil microemulsion is really good for getting into the tissues. Um, so uh, if the molecules start to get bigger, though, they don't carry over or they require high heat. And so in the case of uh, cannabis, we have the, the phenolic resins. Uh, we have to put them under a vacuum in order to distill them properly without burning uh, them uh, and ruining the compounds. And so what a vacuum does in the distillation is it lowers the boiling point uh, of the uh, the compounds. It lowers the boiling temperature of the compounds and they can carry over and get purified that way. So next we're going to move on to the water soluble compounds um, and alkaloids are generally water soluble and contain nitrogen uh, somewhere in their molecular structure. Now um, most real um, alkaloids have the nitrogen group inside of their ring structures in the molecule. Um, and the fact that they contain nitrogen generally makes their pH basic. Uh, and often you can taste this as a, a bitter taste. So when you taste something that has, uh, that has a bitter taste, often you are tasting alkaloids. Not always, but very often. Uh, some of the major alkaloids in the cannabis plant are a class called spermidines. These water-soluble compounds are very cell regenerative and were originally discovered in sperm. Alkaloids are generally more soluble in lower pH uh, acid conditions and many can be precipitated, meaning they are made non-soluble with a higher pH, with a more basic pH. Uh, and this is a uh, this is forms the basis of an important extraction for alkaloids called an AB extraction. That's an acid base extraction, and we'll learn about that in the uh, uh, more deeply in the course in the plant medicine course that I teach. So then we come to polysaccharides, and some polysaccharides are water soluble and some are not. Um, the ones that are of medicinal interest for us are generally the ones that are water soluble. Uh, so polysaccharides are carbohydrates and the word essentially means many sugars. So they're groups of sugar molecules linked together. Cellulose in the cannab cannabis plant is an example of a poly polysaccharide. I'm going to say that again. Uh, cellulose in the cannabis plant is an example of a polysaccharide. There are others, however, the amount of research is pretty small right now. Um, they're not the most uh, interesting compounds in cannabis, and so they haven't gotten a lot of focus, but there may be uh, maybe really useful uh, medicinal properties of them. Um, uh, many polysaccharides of medicinal interest are water soluble, like I said. The cellulose molecule is bonded so well that it requires an enzyme to break it down into sugars. That's why it doesn't really like to dissolve in, uh, in water. Uh, many polysaccharides work on the immune system, muscle and fascia and mucoid tissues. So the, um, the polysaccharides uh, called mucopolysaccharides are uh, compounds that are very slimy when you touch them. Uh, how bark, uh, if you peel it off and, and expose the wood, has a very slimy kind of uh, texture to it if you get it wet. Or aloe uh, is, a, is a polysaccharide, it's a mucopolysaccharide. And so it forms that kind of gel. Now, if you look at the, um, on the right of the slide, you see at the top is chitin and at the bottom is cellulose. Chitin, as I said before, is the protective coating on fungi and insects. And cellulose is obviously what trees and leaves are made of. And if you look at those, um, those molecular pictures there, they're very, very similar. They're almost the same molecule, uh, but not quite but very close. So those are polysaccharides. Uh, on this slide, uh, just gives the basic compounds and where they kind of fit. Uh, we have carotenoids. Uh, those are the um, things like lycopene uh, and carotene. Um, and just that you see that they're a long chain molecule. And the reason they have the colors that they do is um, you see where there are those double lines going through the, the molecule. 
Those double lines are double bonds, pi bonds, and they interrupt the light. And so they absorb certain frequencies of light uh, and then um, and reflect other frequencies of light. And that's a big part of why they're colored. Uh, then on the whole right side, we have those phenolic compounds. And in each of those compounds, if you remember that, um, that phenolic um, molecule, uh, you see that where you have the, um, that ring, um, uh, that hexagonal ring with the OH group. I'm sure you can find that in each one of those molecules. And you can see how many different classes of molecules are actually phenolics. Uh, so that's really, uh, really quite important. Um, and at the bottom, we have um, uh, nitrogen containing compounds, sulfur containing compounds. And it doesn't really have a good, um, a really good uh, description of terpenoids on this slide, but it does give you kind of a sense of what we're dealing with. So in conclusion, um, uh, there are, uh, these are some plants that contain the four classes of compounds. And so if you just ask yourself, well, is, alkaloid, is an alkaloid generally water soluble or oil soluble or solvent soluble? Um, is a polysaccharide polar or nonpolar? Uh, is a phenolic soluble in alcohol or is it soluble in water? Um, and then we have uh, uh, the terpenes, the terpenoids, and what role do they have uh, in all of this? Are they, are they fragrant? Uh, are they essential oils? Those kinds of things. And now a lot of what I said are not hard and fast rules because there's so much variability uh, that there are, um, are lots and lots of exceptions to the rule. But generally speaking, these things hold true, but it's important that you learn about them and get to know uh, do a little research on them uh, and see what uh, um, what the the situation is in any plant that you're you're studying. So again, we have alkaloids in things like coffee and the caffeine, uh, ephedra, ephedrine, belladonna, golden seal, motherwort, mandrake. They all have alkaloids. Polysaccharides, aloe. Echinacea, mallow, slippery elm, Irish moss, all those like good for the good for the tissues. Uh, phenolic compounds, cannabis, turmeric, hops, kava, elderberry, St. John's wort. Um, all of those have uh, certain resinous qualities to them. Uh, some are more soluble in water. Uh, the phenolics are a big group, uh, so we have to look at them sometimes individually. Uh, terpenes. Um, uh, cannabis, anything that has a lot of fragrance in it is generally going to be uh, terpenes, cannabis, rosemary, thyme, lavender, oregano, all those great uh, spices that you, you cook with or that we use for aromatherapy, uh, those are all terpenes. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, we're going to be, or I'm going to be running uh, the class, the course soon. And so if you're interested, please email me. I'm going to do a, a live version in my, um, uh, my plant lab, and then we're also going to be doing an online version coming up uh, as soon as we get that all together. Thank you very much. This is Brian Leto.